really is amazing. Yeah. It's like a, the, the, the hub of a wheel. So many people know that. Okay, we're here, we're live, we're Think Tech, it's Friday. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> and we're doing a Think Tech talk here today with uh, Ramsey Tom, the founder of uh, the Life Enhancement, Enhancement Institute, that's L-E-I, uh, and a co-director of Sustain Hawaii. And we are happy to have him here. Hi, Ramsey. It's good to be here, Jay. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming and down. Happy Friday. Yeah, happy Friday. Happy weekend. Until right. it's coming exactly. up. We deserve a weekend this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to get a handle on, on what you've been doing. So the first thing is, can you tell us about uh, the, the uh, Life Enhancement Institute? Yeah. About and, and can you also tell us about the Sustain Hawaii organization? Sure. Life Enhancement Institute is actually a, a consulting organization, more like a brain trust think tank of... Uh, interrelated businesses and activities that are all focused on enhancing the lives of communities, individuals, businesses, and um, in some ways it, it reflects the disciplines that I've been fortunate to be involved in, uh, both on the cultural side as well as in the contemporary business side. And so the acronym LEI represents LEI, just like the one I'm wearing. Perfect name. And it really ties things together. So a lot of the stuff I do is strategic planning, um, forward thinking, and really f being a convener and a nexus of people who are really moving in a particular direction and finding a place where they can intersect. And so um, it's, it's an interesting Why experience. Why does this remind me of Three Point Consulting? You know those guys? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, 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 it's a parallel, isn't it? I, I think so. I think at some point in time, um, there was an acknowledgment that we can't do things on our own anymore. There needs to be strategic alliances and partnerships. Um, but they move away from collaborations and more towards you know, these convergences where people are moving on stride. And I think that's another organization, in fact, like Sustain Hawaii, all born around at the same time uh, with those same concepts in mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sustain Hawaii is a nonprofit organization mm -hmm. focused on sustainability uh, in our islands um, and looking fundamentally at the basic equation. What do we do now to sustain ourselves without, you know, diminishing the ability of future generations doing the same with a primary focus on food and energy here, here in Hawaii. And of course it all comes out to the same thing, food is energy. Um, so we have online web-based services, but then a lot of it has to do with community uh, engagement and helping community to find a, uh, I guess a place of where they can elevate their ability to sustain themselves. Right? Yeah. So that's what Sustain Hawaii is all about, sustainhawaii.org. Let me put this in the cold water. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you get into this, Ramsey? I mean, this is an amazing yeah. life you're describing. I mean, it sounds like when you're not working on one, you're working on the other. And, and, and they do they do uh, have a synergy about them. Right. But how did, how did you get into it? Well, you know, as uh, I was fortunate to have been mentored by numerous Native Hawaiian practitioners and kupuna, if you would. And there is a continued emphasis on kuleana, responsibility. Not just for self, but for seven generations. So when you... Can you count your family back? Uh, maybe not seven generations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some, some, it's a little difficult to do. We had but, a show uh, yesterday yeah. uh, where Betty Brow, who was the... What is she? She's the uh, chief executive uh, of the Chinese Chamber of Commerce, mm -hmm. and she mm -hmm. had this whole historical timeline mm -hmm. about when the Chinese came to Hawaii. Yeah, yeah. And uh, don't take a guess. Well, what, what did she say? <laughs> well, there are various you know, levels of coming, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. uh, it began in the late 1800s. You know, like a, I want to say uh, right. 1789. Yeah. And then, uh, then th there was business actually being conducted by Chinese uh, people from China right. against the law of China in the early right. 1800s, 1802, 1850, the first organized immigrants, and 1911, what happened in 1911? Something happened in 1911. I, th I think they got organized in Chinatown. Yeah. Uh, but it's really interesting, and um, you know, all of this is worth studying, you know, go back and Absolutely. figure out. Yeah. You say seven generations, I immediately think of that, and I want to know 
about yeah. the seven generations. Yeah. Well, you know, some people look at seven generations from point A, X, and moving forward. But then another perspective is where from where you are, three generations before you and three generations after you. Because you are the product of others' behaviors, representing them. And you're also preparing the next generations moving forward. So it's a continuum. It doesn't end with point A and end at Z. You have to right? see is that's very Chinese, actually. Yeah, and for, fortunately, the, the last name Tom is Chinese. So I'm, I, I sit here as Hawaiian <laughs> Chinese. And so our, our Chinese genealogy is actually um, probably better documented than our Hawaiian genealogy. Yeah. And as you know, because of the names and the number of families and how they chose the names, sometimes it can be difficult to follow that, that yeah. down. But nonetheless, uh, the responsibility of caring for our place and our resources and one another got me into uh, a behavior or a mindset that began to ask particular questions. Uh, if we continue behaving the way we are, and this goes back multiple years now, what are we looking f towards in the future? And having spent some time on the continent, the mainland, coming back home and seeing what had changed and how it was changing, um, I became concerned that you know we were trading off certain things, primarily our, our children's futures, for a lot of the conveniences in, of, of the present. Not to say that I don't like my conveniences, but it really requires a more balanced approach. And so I've been engaged in multiple conversations, and I think you'll find my fingerprints or footprints, if you would, uh, numerous conversations well, having to do with sustainability I've heard your name in many, many times. Yeah. And, and really from a value set. It's not so much condemning the way we behave, it's what we know. But it's it's asking people to rethink, reframe, redefine the way we do things, acknowledging that one, we're operating in a set of biases that makes it very difficult to get out of the condition using the principles that got us here. And you know, smarter than people than I come up with axioms to that that idea. So challenging ourselves through Sustain Hawaii and others to ask the question, what do we do different? And we took a forward thinking approach, systems management approach, by going into the future and asking ourselves, um, now that we're here, how did we get here and what did we do differently? And so that created a series of conversations, uh, activities, and lo and behold, here we are. It sounds like uh, uh, Charles Dickens and the ghost of Christmas future. <laughs> yeah. It's a little scary it's some to classics, do that, you know? Right, right, yeah. It, absolutely. But I, I, underneath all that, we talk about what's scary, is that I had the good fortune of being mentored by um, some very influential and forward-thinking elders, Hawaiian elders, who lived in both worlds. And when I say both worlds, I'm speaking about world views, not so much a West or an Eastern world. And they were quite adamant that as we moved forward, it was important to understand where we came from and acknowledge the fact that our ancestors lived in a place, the most remote place on the planet in some people's minds, successfully in the absence of these technologies, in the absence of boats and planes and ships and planes. And we find ourselves now in time of progress with a population near that which existed. That's, that's so true. Right? That's so true. A moment to dwell on yeah, that, you know. Yeah. Before the before the diseases came, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the, the howly diseases that came sure. from the sailors on the ships, there were a million people on these islands. That's right. And now look again, you know, what, 200 years later, and there are a million people on these islands. That's right. That's right. So th th that's the point, in, you know, a case in point. We ask ourselves, in the name of progress, we have now actually hindered our ability to feed ourselves. And so an observation is that whatever the number might be, between 85 and 90 percent of our food coming from someplace else, we're, Hawaii is more like a life raft waiting to be rescued by a plane or a ship every day because that's where the majority of our food's coming from. And that's scary. the amount of food that we have on island, perishable or, or you know, storable, is re relatively short time, the short limit, you know, anywhere between 7 and 14 days, I'm told. So I have to ask myself, you know, how did our ancestors do that? And what principles were they operating from? And more importantly, what values? So part of my experience has been exploring the value sets and not necessarily saying that we have a values conflict, but we may be prioritizing values differently. Because I think values are global. We all have values. 
but depending on where you're living, you prioritize them differently because of your relationship with your resources. So, you know, long story short, that's kind of how I got into it. Because of the commitment to principles that are native and you know, indigenous to the place, but finding ways of bringing them forward and not just forgetting them. So distinguish for me, in, in terms of mission, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the Life Enhancement Institute, Institute mm -hmm. and Sustain Hawaii. I mean, I, I know there must be overlap, there but is. how would you distinguish them? Well, um, the, the simple overlap, the common denominator is me. The other is that one is for-profit, the other is non-profit. And okay. the for-profit world is really working with um, commercial enterprises, and individuals who are forward-thinking, who are interested in enhancing what they're doing. Not necessarily because of me, but because they want to do something differently. Mm -hmm. um, so my preference is to work with those who have a similar social construct or social value set that um, supports that notion we're going to raise communities and ask a different question when you do business, which is, how do I leave my community better as a result of being here, rather than how do I get better on the backs of community? Uh, even to ask the question is an important thing. It is, and, and, and as a consultant, it's one of the things that I do with the businesses that I have worked with, was start with a new set of questions, because I think that shifts the paradigm. Um, because I think in business, one of the criteria is to have an exit strategy. Well, the residents here, don't, we don't have an exit strategy. We don't plan to, to leave. <laughs> On an island, it's very hard to have an exit yeah, strategy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there's a contradiction because you have a business that comes with an exit strategy. And we've seen historically many of these big businesses and industries have come and left. The question is whether or not they've left us you know, more resilient or stronger or if they've left us weaker. And I would have to suggest that history demonstrates that in many cases we're weaker. Yeah. So the Life Enhancement Institute says, how do you enhance the lives of the businesses you're working with while also doing that with community? Uh, the term synergy may be overused, but what it does suggest is that there is a, a mutual benefit. There is a um, symbiotic relationship between host and guest rather than a parasitic one. And I think we've seen parasitic relationships where industries have come and literally sucked things out of the place, the culture, the people, and, it, oh, and the resources. That happens today, too. Oh, absolutely. And I can't say that we're immune to it or that we've even hopefully matured so we won't do it again. We don't, but we don't do much to change it, too. Precisely. You know, which, yeah. is, which is a problem. Let me, let me uh, ask, when, before we started the show, I asked you... Uh, what should we call the show? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And your answer was, let's call the show Raising the Blue Continent. Yes. So can you explain to the people sure. what, why you chose that name? What does it mean? <laughs> yeah. The, um, we live in, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And if you consider the body of water, the Pacific, and you look at it as a continent rather than the body of water, all of a sudden, we are now in the middle of the largest single mass on the planet. All other continents can fit inside the Pacific. Hawaii in the center of that means that we are in the middle of a new economy versus on the edge of an old one, which tended to be Eurocentric and Western-centric, probably more New Yorkish than they are uh, Californiaish. And so when you, when you think about it from that standpoint, it, it's, um, it shifts the economy of scale, right? President Obama brought uh, 23 economies here several years ago with APEC. And that helped to demonstrate that this new economy of second and third world countries moving into first world economic status. And they're all focused around the Pacific, which means Hawaii's right in the middle. And so we have an opportunity really to build on that as a leader, not as a follower in, in the old uh, paradigm. And when you begin to look at Hawaii and all the other island nations that make up the Pacific, those islands are actually the mountain ranges of, our, of that continent. And when I was growing up, I used to hear stories about people climbing to the tops of mountains to talk to the sages and get the wisdom of, those, of the ancients. Um, if you unpackage that metaphor, Hawaii and the culture of this place, as well as these, neighbor, these islands in the Pacific, we may actually have some wisdom you know, in the cultures We're as well as the place. On we're on the mountain. Yeah. And so maybe it's time to turn to those cultures 
and those that represent those cultures and consider them the sages of the future, drawing from our ancestral wisdom and knowledge. That's kind of the idea. So the blue continent, raising the blue continent is a metaphor for raising consciousness as much as it is this notion of shifting the economies of scale and placing Hawaii in a leadership place rather than one of following. Just to explore the, you know, the relationship between your mission and our mission, mm -hmm. <clears throat> we're raising public awareness Absolutely. about the importance of tech, uh, energy, the environment, and diversification. Uh, so I mean, there's a real parallel there. Absolutely. It was one of the reasons why I was really pleased and grateful that you invited me, because I, I do see that. And, I think that's actually one of the best hopes for Hawaii is to really begin to see our role in that particular yeah. arena. And to have confidence in it and yes. to see excellence and, and go after, make, make ourselves an excellent place. Uh, I don't want to say Switzerland or the Pacific because that's overused and it's mm -hmm. not accurate. Mm -hmm. right. but, but find excellence here and find a unique excellence that the world right. will respect and, uh, and yeah. be in awe of. And it isn't Obviously, it isn't just tourism, and it isn't just weather. Right. It's 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 based on culture. It's based on a special blend of right. of what's happened here, the magic, the miracle of what's happened. Absolutely. Here, you know? I mean, you consider if we look at our our location as an asset rather than a liability, which a lot of people had in the past, and you consider the cultures that are actually here, we are essentially a testing ground for almost any industry, any sector that wants to. We have 11 of the 13 temperate zones, I'm told. So we can do a lot of things. The real question is, are we influencing and in control of what's being tested here? That's because the question. Because there are others who are testing things without our permission and our participation. That's the question. We have to and, be in control. Exactly. And so, so it's a matter of stepping up to that leadership. We're going to take a short break Absolutely. to sort of make sure we're in control. All right. That sounds good. <laughs> this is Think Tech. We're here with Ramsey Tom. We're talking about raising the blue continent. Uh, we'll be right back after this very short break. <laughs> We're back. We're live. We're Think Tech. We're here with Ramsey Tom on a given Friday. We're talking about raising the blue continent, and we'll never finish this discussion, no, no. Ramsey. It's just, it's just starting. Too many, too many issues, too many things. So uh, I want to I want to sort of take that philosophy that you described, which is really critical and important in our time, and I think it's the one kind of approach that that will hold us together going forward. That will make this place or remake it as a special place. I think since statehood. And since, you know, the changes we've seen since statehood, we've lost something. Uh, and we and it's not inconsistent to go to relate back to that right. and also have a good economy and a good a good life here. And the important thing is we have to offer people a good life or we will right. go down the wrong path and it sure. won't be a good end. Uh, so uh, you talked about, um, you know, APEC and business, but what about, um, you know, the sort of the integration of the science as it is coming coming around the world, especially to Hawaii, and and the, the native science, the indigenous science in Hawaii. How do you put those together without offending either side? 
I think that's a good question, and it's it's a question and a conversation that is taking place in many sectors. Um, the science world in particular, I mean, we have an educational system that is focused on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, but there's more to our lives than that, such as art and this concept of sustainability. And so we've kind of coined the idea of STEAMs rather than just STEM, um, because I think <laughs> having a scientific background in the absence of creativity, you just get more robotic over time. Speaking of robots, robotics is actually something that is probably going to be, if not already, in our futures. So if you add that back into that concept, now you have the concept of streams. And I think that's very consistent with the idea of fluidity, liquidity, cash flow. And so it's about blending these principles and concepts. Technology, if we're not careful, can be really heady stuff. But interacting with people, it comes from the heart, right? That's aloha. And so I think what Hawaii has to offer is the concept of aloha, of how we relate to one another and how we treat one another and technology as a, as a tool, as a means and not the ends. And so I think Hawaii is that kind of place because we have all those different cultural, um, I guess the contribution of multiple cultures. Uh, working with Disney recently, we, the, our conversation was, how do you take the best of these two storytelling cultures and bring them together? Interesting. Right? And one is technological, while the other is cultural. Telling stories, having stories, content versus delivery. And we modeled that and said, you know, Hawaii is really about hapa, right? It's about the blending of things. Unlike other, uh, you know, municipalities across the country where you have many, I guess, cultures living, we marry one another here, right? We become related. So while there are... Isn't that true? Yeah, and so it's, it's very different, I think. And I think most people come here will say that. We're not, again, immune to the dysfunctions of, of communities, but I think Aloha has raised the ability to interact um, and I guess tolerable, would be more tolerable in the space that we have here. So I think Hawaii is the ability to move from right left brain thinking to vertical horizontal thinking, where my mind and my heart begin to work together and we become more whole and more mindful in our approaches to dealing with contemporary problems um, because we look for solutions instead. Well, well help me on the science thing. Um, you know, looking at it from the point of view of, oh, say, Ed Cadman. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> who was the first dean of the new medical school, yeah, yeah. you know. Um, Cadman wanted to build a, a, a big campus of right. big pharma around the medical school. He wanted to bring them here from everywhere. He wanted to create, uh, you know, big pharma research companies. Mm -hmm. uh, he wanted to have a lot of, uh, a lot of capital from the mainland. Mm -hmm. He wanted to have a lot of jobs mm -hmm. for people. It never got off the ground, and, right. I, and I'm really sad about that, right. as it could have been terrific. Mm -hmm. uh, and now instead we're going to build all these high-rises, right. where they, right. you know, it might have been. Um, but how do, you, how do you reconcile? I'll never forget, just to seed the story a little sure. bit, um, after <clears throat> that big fight about the uh, A and B project there yeah. in Kaka'ako, which effectively displaced Cadman's initiative mm -hmm. and, and, and sort of put it off to the side, so it was never thought about much again. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I was walking down the promenade there on, on Kaka'ako Makai, and there was a fellow who was, he was um, sort of supervising some of the surfers, and I said, you know, and, and they were opposed to that mm -hmm. big A and B project. So I said to him, you know, what do you think about a tech community here, just like Cadman wanted? What do you think about big pharma all over Kaka'ako? He says, tech? He says, tech is not for the local people. Mm. And that stuck with me since then. Don't we have to make tech for the local people? Don't we have to bridge the gap? Isn't the process you describe really a two-way street uh, where each side has to reach out to the other? You know, a sure. host and guest sort of thing reaching out. Uh, but both, si both sides have to understand that. They have to be That's on the right. same page about that. Right. You know? right. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's funny because I think we tend to use terms loosely, like integration. Interesting you bring up Dean Cadman because he actually sat on an organization called the um, a Consortium of Integrative Health. 
And so when he stepped away, I was invited to take his place on that consortium. Um, and we talked about the integration of health, um, native practices along with contemporary allopathic medicine. And unfortunately, a lot of times, integration is really the superimposition of the dominant thought over something else. It's like consensus is the same. The same yeah, problem, exactly. You know, <laughs> I, I'm I'm always right until you're wrong. Um, <laughs> exactly. that, Thank you for right, that. that type of See, thing. you learn real wisdom here <laughs> in ThinkTech. <laughs> right? and, and you're always wrong because I'm always right. Um, it, it's it's one of those types of things. So it goes back to your earlier question, why lay? Well, because at some point in time, it's taking what appears to be disparate parts and putting them on a common background. And they come together and they create something more beautiful, just like our children in Hawaii, right? That hapa blend, right, uh, has to also come with the hanai, right, the adoption of the values and concepts as well. So it's not just I'm shoving this down your throat, I'm going to force you to do it. But can we um, come to an agreement or an understanding that, like a stew pot, right, we talk about melting pot, I don't to go stew because it's, it creates a gravy, right? <laughs> Thank you for that. That's right? great. Yeah. It, 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 and the parts don't necessarily lose their identity, yeah. but it's the gravy that comes together. And I it's think the value, the, added. The value add, right? <laughs> and so I think the, the old technologies and the new technologies, technologies of culture that have lived in the place for thousands of years, um, blending with cultures or technologies that are taking advantage of new materials, working together to come up with something suitable and relevant for a particular place. And I think relevance has a lot to do with it. Yeah. I mean, we have policies and practices from the continent that when you apply them here to our environmental condition, it doesn't fit, it's irrelevant. So I think we have to be more mindful about that. And I think, as you said, we need to create a safe place to have the conversation and say that, how do we bring these things together? Because obviously people lived in the place successfully before we got here. Would, would you agree with me though that that we uh, we might have had it before but we don't mm. have it quite right now a container you know uh, a, a set of fundamental rules of engagement mm -hmm. if you will mm -hmm. where everybody in the room you know whatever room it may be um, is as follows those very principles that you articulated I think so often the people in the room are in there for an agenda and they're not going to listen to the other guy at all. Yeah. Uh, see that all the time. Uh, and if they, even if they appear to be listening, they're not really listening. That's you true. have to open your mind, open your heart, don't you? You uh, do. Do we, do we have that, I guess as you're going to agree with me, that we don't, we, we're a little rough on that these right. days. And if you do agree with me, what do we do to smooth it out? Well, I, I think we have to identify and acknowledge that we are in that place. I mean, change happens when you acknowledge that where you are, right, isn't a suitable or preferred condition. And so how do you move to preferred condition? The challenge for many of us, however, is that that's what we know. And in fact, there are the same individuals that got us to this place are being called upon to get us out. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, they're using the same principles, concepts, and ideas that got us here in the first place. So how do we assist them in their leadership roles to open the door to new ways of thinking, right? And allow a new way of getting us into the future. Thank them and acknowledge the fact that they got us to where we're at, but we, we need a new way. And that new way may incorporate, and this may sound contradictory, some of these older principles that are rooted in the place because we're we're bringing principles from other places that may look similar but they certainly aren't same. Give me they, an example they, of a principle. Yeah, well one of the principles is um, watershed management. Okay. Okay, there are practices and principles in watershed management. When you take the rules and regulations for a watershed that is 300 miles long and apply it to a watershed that is 3 miles long, Something's, I, I, give. something's gonna give, right? Yeah. It, it, it's scale and scope, etc. Um, then you have this notion of uh, desalinated water. That's a technology. People say, well, look at all the water around you. That's the desalinated water. Well, why don't we look at the conservation side first rather than just automatically going to desalinated water, which works in a desert, but we're not necessarily in a desert. We do have water, but we're taking water that's falling, what little is falling, because we are seeing less of it falling. We've created perme impermeable surfaces, 
right, by putting more cement on the ground, actually creating pathways for water that could be captured inland, directing it directly to the ocean, and then wanting to bring it back on island at great, using, at great expense. And so it's somewhere in there, that's just not logical. That doesn't make sense. It costs dollars, but doesn't make any sense. So it's in those kinds of situations that I think if we rethink this and begin to look at our behaviors, we may find a new path. And that's something you and I talked about previously is technology is a means, it's not the ends. And if we're not careful, we can invest in technologies that just give permission for bad behavior, <laughs> yeah. right? And so it's really about behavior. Yeah. And, and well, and, and part of what you said is it's about respecting the environment because, yes. uh, because you know, for for many years, for the, when those million people were here, there was ample fresh water for That's them. Right. That's right. And the aquifers have suffered. You know, aquifers get damaged, right. and uh, once they get damaged, it's, they don't really repair themselves. No, no. And when you build all around them with all that concrete, it, it changes the way the uh, forget what the lens, the lens in right. the aquifer is is is. is is beat up and uh, so it's a serious problem and we are going to have, I agree with you, going forward, this is one of those sustainability points, isn't it? That's right. if, if, unless we do something about that, uh, we're going to have a problem. I wrote a, I wrote a piece asking what happened, you know, to, um, um, what do you call it, desalination. Mm -hmm. And um, of course I, I, didn't, I didn't really have a, a good answer from the, the boards of water supply. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the first order of business is to see exactly what we have. Right. And to, it's like energy, and to deal in, in efficiency first and sure. conservation first. Exactly. And then, then you isolate the problem that way. That's right. But if you just go and spend $10 billion on a desalination plant, you're probably not doing the right thing. That's right. And, and I think to your question earlier about the blending of science, we look at the Hawaiian Ahupua management system, that was an engineered system, uh, but it used natural science. And the terminology they use and the rules and regulations, the rules of engagement, as you said, uh, we call those kapu. Now, the contemporary world has defined kapu as um, prohibitions. Well, in many ways they are, but those were conservation laws. They acknowledged cycles. They acknowledged uh, the ages of particular fish and animal and flowers. When was a good time to hunt and not hunt? So these kapu systems... Um, Sounds like the Bible. Yeah, yeah, There's a lot of information there. Absolutely. Yeah, and if you live by it, you'll do better. Precisely. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, less is more. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> we still have to do a break, though. Sure. <laughs> That's Ramsey Tom. We're talking yeah. about raising the blue continent, and he's the founder of Life uh, Enhancement Institute and the co-director of Sustain Hawaii. We're getting a lot of really good thoughts, good philosophies, important things to live by here. We'll be right back after this break. Oh. <laughs> Okay, we're back. We're live. It's Think Tech on a given Friday. It's a Think Tech Talk with Ramsey Tom, a founder of the Life Enhancement Center and a co-director of Sustain Hawaii. 
Um, and he's here talking about raising the blue continent, which means raising, what, awareness about our situation and the ocean around us. Yeah, and our place in it, uh, our role, and, and perhaps even our responsibilities. Yes. You know, yes. Um, to ourselves as well as to those that follow. It's a philosophical system you're describing. It's it a is. state of mind, and it has great relevance, I think, to current life in Hawaii. Sometimes uh, I worry that Hawaii is adrift, you know, and, we, and we're not together on right. fundamental goals and desires and, and, and branding and, you know, ph philosophies. So here you are actually offering that. And yes. It's pretty valuable, I think. So uh, let, me, let me apply those principles that openness you talked about, the collaboration, the um, blending, blending of cultures and ideas yeah, yeah. In, in this special place. So what about just at random, not, not necessarily of importance, but what about Kaka'ako? Kaka'ako is a, there's a tension there between um, development, and the government seems to be behind development, mm -hmm. and the people who live there, and the people who are concerned that this is as kind of a last, a last chance for the city to remake itself. Right. Uh, where do the principles take you on that issue? Well, I, I have a f fond connection with Kaka'ako because um, when I was with the Kamehameha Schools Bishop of State many years ago, one of my mentors was uh, Papa Lyman, Richard Lyman, and he was adamant that the name was Kaka'ako and not Kaka'ako. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> and Kaka'ako was moving and vibrant rather than something slow and dull. <laughs> and um, so here we are. I mean, we're, we're looking at how do we bring vibrancy to a place that for many years has really been kind of slow. The challenge, of course, is how do you do that um, without damaging your heritage or forgetting your heritage, or creating a place that um, I guess is inhab isn't habitable from the standpoint of relationships. We're creating more boxes than we are places for interaction. Uh, some of us are actually calling, uh, beginning to call Ala Moana Boulevard, uh, Ala Moana Canyon because the anticipation of 400 foot towers on one side and 20 foot towers and 200 foot towers on the other side, seeing this canyon of buildings. Now, I'm an advocate for compact design, but I think that's different than high density design. And I think we just have to be careful about how we do that. What are our values? What do we care about? What are we concerned about? Um, do we, have we created enough jobs for the people that we're inviting? Is there an economy that can support the living wage for someone to engage in that? And who, who's going to be living there? Who's going to be working there? Um, I, I don't know that I have a crystal ball, and I don't know that anyone has the, the right answer. But maybe we aren't asking the right questions. Um, so I think rather than operating from a place of scarcity, which many people do, we run to a, a particular solution. Maybe we need to redefine the problem. We really ask ourselves, what is the real problem, long term and not just short term? Um, I think I, I hear what I, what I hear and what you're saying is, let's not come with an agenda. Correct. Let's look at the larger effect on on the place, the people, the whole society in Hawaii, uh, r without advancing either one side or the other. Because I think you know you have you have developers they want to build. That's correct. Just don't get in my way. I want to build. You have government, and government wants to get reelected yep. uh, and look good. Uh, and, and it's not necessarily important about exactly what they do. And what they do, by the way, you know, lives after them. Long after they're gone, um, the results of what they do are visited upon us and our That's progeny. Um, and uh, so you know, what I get out of this is that if you, if you have the right container we talked about, mm -hmm. uh, the container goes beyond just those, those agendas that people right. bring into the room. Right. So you've got to have a, a view where you sort of leave your agenda at the door. Right, <laughs> you know? right. Well, especially if you're, su if you're suggesting, or if you'd like to suggest, that what I'm doing is to make an improvement, right? That's one of the selling points. And frankly, Jay, I have never met anyone that's come from the mainland or elsewhere with a proposition that doesn't work. No one's going to come here with a failing resume. Oh, I failed everywhere, and I think I can make it here. So, I mean, so let's start there. We know that you want to help, but what does help really look like? There's a Chinese proverb about a monkey wanting to help a fish, and his help is to put the fish in the tree. And the monkey's helping from his perspective, but the fish said okay when he was asked. I think in many ways our communities are, are, are like that. We have been 
accepting help from others for so long. We really don't know what help we need, nor do we know what our skill sets and our assets and strengths are because we've been relying on others to tell us that. And unfortunately, when you do that, you, you fall victim to these other things. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I work with developers who are conscious and interested in maintaining heritage, making sure sense of place is there, um, and operating with the sustainable sustainable axioms That's in place. That's very valuable to and, them. And, and it is valuable. They need to have somebody like you uh, to, to help them through it. Somehow. Well, I, I appreciate it. And for those that I do work with, you know, I have great aloha for because in many ways they're, they're, they're taking risks because what they know and what we know of development has a certain set of criteria. But when we look at the criteria, we realize that criteria, if we call it the black box, that black box is still operating the way it has always operated. We may be putting more new stuff in it, but we're getting the same stuff out because the black box still operates that way. And we're tinkering with it a little, but we're not really making significant changes. So whether it's Chinese dollars coming in, why is it different from the Japanese dollars 20 years ago or 30 years ago? We're really not doing anything different. We're just playing the game of saying that we have more dollars come in, so let's be happy. But, but at some point in time, reactive. it's not proactive. That's right. We're not really changing. The, the bottom line is our behavior underneath all that hasn't changed. Yeah. Um, we have a service industry, great. But is the service industry getting stronger, and can they survive in the absence of the Chinese bubble or the Korean bubble or that you kind know, of dependency doesn't doesn't bode well. No, we we've created a codependent economy. Yeah, yeah. And and one axiom suggests that if you're not really making changes and you just stay the same, the law of entropy is in play. We're actually declining more rapidly than we think we are. So and who, so who is going to lead lead the troops on this? I mean, I absolutely agree. I think most people absolutely agree yeah. that we can't just stay the same. Staying the same is a recipe for disaster right. on a grand scale. But, you know, and we, and we wait on government to yeah. fix it, but right. government doesn't fix it. That's right. Um, and, and if government has, you know, has a brilliant statement to make, well, then it's, it's like the myth of Sisyphus. Yes. They make the statement, and then they forget, and then somebody else remembers, but nothing gets done over right. the term. So where is this going to come from? Where is, who has institutional memory? Who will push a solution? Well, we're in an awkward place, Jay, because we have leaders that have been in position for a very long time who have, haven't invested in the new leadership. So there's this gap, and consequently, as you're saying, that institutional organizational memory, we, we've got gaps in memory. And so we run the risk of putting new thinkers and, and new energy into a pond that is already poisoned, if you would, right? And that's not to say that those are there are poisonous. But I think the metaphor is, I can't take fish out of a pond and heal it and put it back into a pond that is still ill. We have to fix the entire system. And at some point in time, it's gonna take community. Community has got to engage the system called government and governance in a way that we haven't done in a very long time. The process, if you would, is a proposal comes up and then they have what I like to call a, a telling and not a hearing, you know? <laughs> that you, happened in the Kaka'ako meeting on Wednesday. Absolutely, <laughs> it's, it's more a telling than it is a hearing um, because they're there to tell us what's going on, but they give you a few minutes, if at all, to really express your thoughts. So consequently, we've created an environment of activism because people like a toddler knows you're not gonna hear me, you're giving me a few minutes. So we get very animated, get very loud, and appear to be disorderly. And so th that tension between the decision-making body and those being affected by those decisions isn't a very clean one. And so consequently, the process by which we engage in these conversations for forward thinking um, needs to be repaired. Well, and the people who run for office need, need to you know, buy into what you're talking about. And, carry it forward. Uh, I mean, would you run for office? Would you consult with somebody who did run for office or won an election? Because that's where it can really make a difference. Sure. And a lot of legislators are, they're not really Akamai about what, you, what you're saying. Yeah, you know, um, there have been many overtures over the years for my others asking me to step into that. I, I'm finding how I'm, I'm, I'm more effective working with those who are in those positions 
because I can cover more ground. And more importantly, I'm not encumbered, or wouldn't be encumbered, by the policies and practices that are internal to the system right now that keep, they rotating. There needs to be some external insider outsider uh, relationship. So we can say, look, the barometer is this. This is changing, this isn't changing. In the absence of those voices, and I think those are the kinds of voices I'm trying to encourage, is that community needs to step up. Um, there's an old adage that says, we teach people how to treat us. And I think if our communities don't expect better treatment, we're going to continue to get the treatment. So expectations. Yeah, it's, it's an expectation. After the break, Ramsey, I'd uh -huh. like to talk about uh, the Constitutional Convention that we didn't have a couple of years ago. <laughs> and get your feeling in sure. and take your temperature on that. Because it's it'll come up in another seven or eight sure. years and, and we should As be ready should. for it. Yeah. Um, this is uh, Jay Fidel on Think Tech Talks here on a given Friday with Ramsey Tom, the founder of the Life uh, Enhancement Institute and co-director of Sustain Hawaii. And we're talking about raising the blue continent right, right here, right now. We'll be right back after this break. Okay, we're still here, and we're back, we're live. Uh, we're at Think Tech Talks on a Friday with Ramsey Tom, uh, founder of the Life Enforcement Institute and co-director of Sustain Hawaii. And we're talking about raising the blue continent, which is a really important thing to do. Who went from in, uh, okay. enhancement to enforcement, so let's make sure oh, it's enhancement. The, 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 the life, the life <laughs> enhancement. I think, I think that's subliminal. We yeah. want to start enforcing some things. I, I won the penmanship contest in the fifth grade, but it's been downhill ever since. <laughs> That's the Life Enhancement Institute, yes, of course. Um, anyway, uh, so we're getting, we're sort of skirting around the issue of leadership. Right. And we have these, uh, these you know, Hawaii things that, that always seem to pop up and nobody has much of an answer for it. One of them is, uh, you know, the, the nail that stands up gets hammered down, yeah. which is troublesome mm -hmm. if you want to run for office or anything. Uh, it's, and in Hawaii, I mean, just have one thing in your background that's troublesome and you'll you get hammered down. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing is the alamihi, uh, which, you know, I, the crabs are the, mm -hmm. uh, I think, um, 
you know, maybe that doesn't work the way we thought, but right. but it still is a phenomenon right. that gets in the way where where you can't climb out of a pot for some reason or another. Right. So how do we make leaders here? Uh, how do we get them in office? How do we give them the pat on the back they need to feel good about taking chances and raising the blue country? Yeah, I, I, I think I, I think it starts one in the home and the school. When children don't see their parents lead, then they don't develop a, a leadership ethic, right? So I think leadership and, and that ethic starts in the home, where you know parents are leading their children or exposing them to experiences such as in team sports and things where there is that exposure of working together, but then relying on certain individuals to guide and support them. The other thing is, I think, to your point is, how do you create a place of safety where we're not afraid of mistakes, that mistakes are actually something um, that enhance our leadership capacity and our learning. Failure is actually part of success, but we've separated that so much. Um, as a martial artist, um, younger days, I, I started out in judo. My father took me there. And when I look at judo as an example, your whole first experience is being thrown, falling down, ultimately so you learn to get up. And we don't do that anymore. We don't do that in society where we actually teach people how to do a backfall, right? So that they learn to get up. We don't teach them how to roll and accept being thrown around by someone who's caring for you. So consequently, very few, very few of us are really willing to take the risk of making a mistake because we eat you. I mean, this community just eats you alive for one failure, if not multiples, but never really looking at the long term. It goes back to your point earlier, short-term thinking, right, supported by scarcity thinking, supports that kind of fear and anxiety, rather than one that is more uh, encouraging and supporting. So I think part of it, leadership, is creating um, safe spaces for leaders to, to develop, and really redefining what leadership looks like, you know. Apparently, we're not the only ones, you know, having this problem. I think no, it exists all over. Yeah. And it's just part of living in the 21st century that, you know, the soft life uh, where you get what you need and somebody, somebody offers you uh, a life without contention, um, then you don't contend. And, you, and you, you know, less and less you're actually engaged in trying to improve the uh, enhancement. That's right. Of life. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I, I think uh, really it's if you raise public awareness about these things, then at least you have a chance of um, affecting people, if not in this generation, then maybe in the next generation. But yeah. one of the things that troubles me about Hawaii, <clears throat> my wife actually knows somebody who is in her 40s or 50s mm -hmm. who has never left Oahu, never left Oahu mm -hmm. in her whole life. Mm -hmm. Um, that, that troubles me because I think that travel, for all the troubles of travel, <laughs> right these days, there was a, there's a State Department advisory out right now <laughs> about American citizens going into the Middle East. Yeah, exactly. That's really scary. Stay home. <clears throat> Stay home. But but travel is the best educator of right. all. Right. It's a, a cultural level, a social level, on technology. It's on everything. You everything you see right. opens your eyes. <clears throat> We're not traveling enough, I think, in Hawaii. We, in fact, some islands, they don't want to go to another island. Right. They don't want to give energy to another island. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. They want that island to stay away from yeah. them. Don't bring anybody over here. Um, that kind of thing is very insular. Uh, so how do we fix that? Well, I, I think you're right. I mean, insular thinking is probably one of the things that contributes to all of the other syndromes that mm -hmm. you've already mm -hmm. mentioned. Well, because when the only thing that you have to measure yourself by is yourself, or your neighbor, then there's not much growth is going to happen. And so that insular thinking tends to do that. That said, we have seven and a half million people coming to our, our shores on a regular basis. So they can contribute to that. But I think what has changed is that we no longer engage them yes. the same way. Good point. Right? It was a visitor industry before. So people came and visited. Yes. And I engaged Good you. Point. We did things yes. together. Yes. So we learned from one another. So I didn't necessarily have to go someplace 
to learn something new from someone else. Yeah. But now we've created this servant relationship with people, and so consequently, you don't have that quite the open exchange. We don't send Christmas cards or birthday cards to the stranger we met or we invited from the hotel to our home anymore. It's become um, much more sanitary than it was before for a number of reasons, and some of them good, and not mm -hmm. some, yeah. some others not so good. Um, but also the idea that the cost of traveling, I mean, I understand why the airlines have done it, but to see them, an airline making billions of dollars on bags, which you, bag fees, you know it's part of the, the process. So again, it, it's... It makes us more insular if we if there's a, a, an economic barrier to go to the next island. That's right. You know, when, uh, when we were kids, um, everybody was out there with a, with a mat and sorries and, and an igloo you know, taking boyfriend, girlfriend to the neighbor islands yeah, and yeah. it would cost, you know, I don't know, $25 yeah. round trip. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now you want to try that, it's going to cost you close yeah. to 300 round trip yeah. and yeah. most people cannot afford that. Yeah, it's a, hard, it. it's a hard thing to do. That said, we're here talking about technology and fortunately we can see other places. There is virtual travel, you can do that, but to do it with intent you know, the idea that I can learn from others elsewhere. Uh, video conferencing, you can talk to people yes. and you can see places, yeah. and which is actually good for some of the places because there are places here in Hawaii we don't feed trampling over, but I can still share that with them if we use technology properly. So once again, there's some blending opportunities. But until we acknowledge that our, our strength is, we get stronger by these kinds of engagements, we won't do it. The, the last point I would probably make is that your observation of someone that hasn't left the island, there are actually children that have not crossed the Pali. There are children that have never left Waianae or Nanakuli to come into town. I mean, there are points on the island you just don't cross. There's, that's the badlands, you know? I don't want to go there. And I, I think those communities would be richer with the experiences of being able to travel. And as a community, we should reach out to them and find ways of, of being able to do that. I guess my bottom line is how do we become more community oriented in our business and our technology and just where we are in, in the world, you know, our, our cultures allow us to do that sharing. Allah is a fundamental, fundamental part of that, that process. And so I, I think we've got a lot of opportunity. We've got challenges, but we have a lot of opportunity. Correct me on this, but <clears throat> um, we had a guest in here last week. Uh, and Meyer, uh, Melly Meyer. Melly, yeah. I don't know if you know her. I know her. Beautiful well. woman, yeah. yeah. And she she used the Hawaiian word I like to close the program with, and I'm not sure that I have it right. It was Ho'o Pee Kakoa. Kako. Kako. And I think it means coming together as one. Is that right? Yeah, Ho'o Pee Kako. Uh, the, the notion that we stick together yeah. as one. A yeah. whole is the notion of combining or action. Yeah. Pili is that we're connected, you know, and when we stick to it. And Kako is it's all of us. It's we're all in this together. And yeah. for a voyaging community, a voyaging society, to get on a canoe, you don't throw people off your canoe. You know, because you need all hands. And when you live on an island, the axiom is that an island is a canoe, a canoe is an island. Um, unlike some television shows, we don't throw, pe throw people off islands either. You can leave if you want, but we're not. Our intention is not to throw you off. One, because we recognize that the diversity of our community is what makes us stronger. And when we homogenize that community, we begin to lose those valuable pieces that make us a stronger community. And I think Melly's point is well taken. Yeah. We, we've got to acknowledge that we all have something to contribute. Yeah. We all have different intelligences. Yeah, we need to welcome that. That's Ramsey Tom. What a great, uh -huh. what a great discussion. He's the founder of the uh, Life Enhancement Institute. That's correct. And a co-director of Sustain Hawaii. We've been talking about raising the blue continent. It's been a great discussion. Thank you, Ramsey. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Thanks for having soon. me. I will. Aloha. Aloha. Mahalo. Aloha. <laughs>